This being my magna opus, I figured I'd dress up for the occasion. I think you like this shirt. This is, uh, let me show you the shirt. Look at that sucker. That's, uh, King James of California. Believe it or not, King James, I'm not kidding you, too. Um, and I know people think King James is special, and I know why, but it actually is not the King James. It's the, uh, it's the Masoretic text and the Textus Receptus. That's what's special. You just need one of these things here. And you don't need a King James Bible. You can use a half a brain. And you'll be all right with that. That's the uh, interlinear. Um, uh, the glasses, are, they're, they're um, so, uh, style science. You can get them at the drugstore. Uh, and um, the bling bling. That was the, almost $3 I had to pay for that. The supermarket. The toy, the toy department the supermarket. Um, okay, now let's see here. Biblical foreknowledge or scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. Um, let me start with one primitive example. And, and then we'll get into uh, cosmology because the purpose of this video is to um, encourage cosmologists to consult the Bible for directions in making um, cosmological modeling um, in the same way that archaeologists use the Bible to um, direct their paths in, on the field in um, biblical territory. Um, Genesis 2.7 says uh, man was formed of the earth. So we can predict from that that the uh, products or the elements that you would find in the human body would all, you would also be able to find in the earth, that they're common elements. <clears throat> now, of course, that was verified scientifically, I guess, in the 1700s. Around there, 17, 1800s, uh, when elements were being uh, isolated, and they came to the realization that, that that is, in fact, accurate information from the Bible. Um, now, I'm going to suggest the Bible is a better predictor of the future than math modeling. And the reason I say that is because um, mathematical modeling can only predict. Uh, how should we say it, events that um, are not subject to chaotic or um, extreme dependence on initial conditions. Uh, now, in fact, I want to read from um, as the Paul Davies about time, and there's an excellent description of what um, chaotic um, problems present for predictability. Chaos theory suggests that many physical systems are chaotic, but some like human brain operate at the edge of chaos. A, a chaotic system is one which although in a strict mathematical sense deterministic is nevertheless so highly sensitized to minute disturbances that meaningful predictions over a long term period is precluded. Now that's interesting because that Bible is not a subject to that handicap, so to speak. Um, the Bible has predicted, despite those uh, conditions that make it impossible for humans to predict. And I think my best example it, it would be from um, the history of the Israelites, because that's something that can be examined uh, throughout um, the history of the world, and it's ongoing right now. In a sense, um, Einstein was right about um, his problems with, say, God does not play dice. But it's not because uh, Heisenberg, um, uncertainty is inherently wrong. It's just that um, God is not going to be uh, prevented from making predictions because of um, uncertainty principle. Um, now, uh, as far as the Israelites are concerned, um, there's been prophecies, and I know that uh, there's been the accusation that, for instance, the Israelites going back to Israel now can be a matter of collusion, that they're going there purposely to fulfill that prophecy. Well, I have a couple problems with that. First of all, 
I don't know any Israelites who are citing that reason for their returning to Israel. But it goes further than that because in the prophecies pertaining to Israel history, you have things like the Assyrian captivity, uh, which was prophesied that there would be mass starvation and uh, great uh, suffering amongst the Israelites. Do you suppose that they um, colluded to bring that ab upon themselves just for the sake of fulfilling prophecy? See, that that's not a reasonable... Um, uh, not a reasonable conclusion to draw. So, at any rate, I'm going to say that um, Israeli history um, proves that God has predictable powers above and beyond mathematical modeling, which is um, actually very limited. So, what I want to do is look at some of the some of the possible uh, predictions that you can make from the Bible. Now, there's uh, this is kind of fun because there's so many. There's so many different um, things in the Bible that you can um, look at and interpret as um, predictors. I mean, I could go on and on. I have just, I think, nine or ten examples. Um, but I can think I, of going on and on with uh, hundreds of them, probably. Um, God said, for instance, um, in the Bible, he's uh, considered infinitely powerful. Okay, so if that's the case, um, I'm going to suggest that when we're looking for uh, solutions for um, elementary uh, characteristics of particle behavior, for instance, or particle quantities, they're going to need to be renormalized um, because the underlying um, power behind them is, in fact, infinite. I want to, I got another something to read here from a book called S Super Strings talking about renormalization re and, and how this, I think, um, ties in with the idea that God is infinitely powerful and that the creation itself was created uh, from an infinite power. Uh, and this is with Richard Feynman and um, the question was posed to him. Infinities have plagued quantum field theory over a generation. Do you think that a fundamental theory of different particle interactions can still contain these infinities? Or do you think that uh, Dirac was right to say he couldn't believe any theory that contained these infinities? And Richard Feynman says, obviously there are no infinities in observation. The mass of the electron is not infinite. When we take electrodynamics in a conventional sense, without adding all the new modifications, we write the equation down and then calculate the mass in the electron and find it to be infinite. Then we have to play a kind of shell game and say that this isn't the way um, we're supposed to calculate the mass. We're supposed to subtract something from something and do this and that. And then uh, these rules are called renormalization or re reorganizational rules, which produce the theory in which all the answers are finite and agree with experiment. That seems to be the case, but do we know whether this reorganized form is mathematically consistent form? What's very interesting is that in all these years, we have never proven one way or the other whether it is consistent. But for the moment, suppose that it turns out to be consistent. Then we have a mathematical structure, which is write, this wrong, write these wrong equations, that is, when you get infinities, play the subtraction game invented by these three guys back in 1947, and take the limit and straighten it out. This will be a finite theory, and those are the answers. This is a mathematical structure, even though it sounds messy. Now, it should be possible one day for someone to work out more carefully in a different way a set of equations that are, there aren't any infinities um, and get the same consequences. I don't mean inventing a new physics, but rather reorganizing the statement of what it is um, you do to make calculations less awkwardly written. So, at any rate, there are those games that have to be played, so to speak, by the, by the mathematical modeling uh, to eliminate the infinities, and I'm saying that the infinities, according to the Bible, um, should be there, but they do need to be re, um, renormalized. And that brings me to, I have sort of a renormalization theory that there are three levels. Um, there's where God dwells, which is an infinite um, manifestation. Then there's a step down, like a step down transformer. You have heaven, where the angels are, and then you have another step down where we are on earth. And um, I'm going to continue part two and we're going to look at some more.